to launch John Rees's new book, ABC of Socialism. Uh, I'll say new book, it's not entirely a new book. Um, I remember reading it when I first became Maximum Politics, and um, it was very useful indeed that John's rewritten it um, and, and updated uh, some, some of the examples in it. Um, so, so it's particularly relevant um, today. Now, John's um, a member of Council Fire who are a public press on. He's also a co founder uh, of the Stop the War Coalition. So, uh, he will speak for about 20 minutes, uh, about a bit of plenty of time to, to ask questions and have a discussion uh, from before as well. Um, I'm Kenny, by the way, and I always get to introduce myself at the beginning of the uh, chair of meetings. But um, without much further ado, I'll hand over to John and introduce you. Sweet. Well, some of you may have seen that in the last week, um, the, um, the uh, Governor of the Bank of England um, has made a statement. Really, um, you might have thought that the, the leader of the Labour Party made, might have made, but he didn't. Um, and what Mark Carney pointed out um, was that inequality um, in this country is now greater than it was when Queen Victoria sat on the throne. Now, that's an amazing thing. Uh, to think about the society that you live in. And it's a rich society, it's an industrialised, rich society. Um, it's an amazing thing to think um, about the country that you live in in the 21st century. But I want to give you some kind of um, sense of what that means to live in a country that looks like that. And um, the way I want to do it is, is like this. Um, I want us to, to imagine that we're going to see uh, a grand parade. And the parade is going to last an hour, and during that hour, the entire population of Britain will pass before us. But there's something very strange about these people, because their height will be determined by their income. So the poor will be very, very small, and the rich will be correspondingly taller. Now, we're going to assume that we are the average income of all society, and therefore we are the average height. Now, this is what you would see. In the first five minutes of the parade, you will see people go before you who are no taller than matchsticks or cigarettes. Now, these are people who are not in full-time employment, although they may be in some casualised or part-time employment. They will perhaps be uh, FE students and still living at home, people on uh, social security. By the time um, the next five minutes has gone past, that is, we're into ten minutes of the hour, you will see go before you, and the height will not have changed massively. Now perhaps you'll be seeing people who are uh, one foot or one foot six high. You'll begin to see um, people who are long-term unemployed or long-term welfare dependent. Some people who are in full-time work but on very, uh, very low wages. As we move towards the quarter of an hour, you'll begin to see people who are perhaps two foot or three foot high, still, still the height of elves go before you. And these will be low-paid civil servants. Um, there'll be um, some nurses as we reach into 20, 25 minutes. People are still four foot or uh, uh, no higher. The vast majority, by the way, of the black and Asian population in this country has already uh, passed, uh, passed uh, before us. You'll begin to see now um, people who are the absolute dead center of uh, the economy. These are full-time uh, white collar workers, uh, skilled manual workers, and as we reach towards the half an hour, we'll still be looking down on their heads. They won't yet have reached our collarbone. Now, perhaps we would be thinking that since we are the average height for the economy and we're now midway through this parade, half an hour, we would begin to be able to look people in the eye. But the height grows with painstaking slowness. Still far into the distance, there are people who are below our height. As we go into 40 minutes past the hour, the vast majority of working people, and indeed some middle class people, owners of poor shops doing poor, uh, doing poor trade, have gone, be uh, have gone before us, and we're still only barely beginning to look them in the eye. It's not until we've gone three quarters of an hour into the parade that we begin to see people who are our height. That goes on for another five minutes, but then in the last 10 minutes of the hour, 
things begin to change very, very rapidly, uh, very, very rapidly indeed. So, we now begin to see um, some head teachers go by. Um, they're perhaps uh, six foot six, seven foot, perhaps eight foot high. Head of department going by eight foot or nine foot high. These are people who don't think that they're by any means in the top 15 or 10 percent of the income of the income band. Then we begin to see a not particularly prosperous lawyer go past. He's 18 uh, feet high. A university professor goes past. He's 27 or 30 feet high. We're moving towards the last five minutes of the hour now. Now we're beginning to see real giants go past us. CEOs of big corporations are going past. They're perhaps 150, 180 uh, feet high. Prince Philip goes past. He's 180 uh, feet high. We're into the last minute now and things become um, bizarre. We now begin to see people who are the head of McAlpine or Shell or British Petroleum or McDonald's go by. They're the size of tower blocks. They're blotting out the sun in this, uh, in this parade. And then in the last minute, we see people whose height is almost incalculable. A member of the Getty family goes by or perhaps um, Bill Gates. These people are miles high. Uh, five miles high. Bill Gates, one of the Getty family, probably 10 miles high. Now there's a good thing here because the atmosphere only goes up for five <laughs> miles. Um, so they're in trouble. Um, but that, that picture, which I first read when I was at school, um, is now 40 years old. And in every year since it was first written by the economist Jan Penn, that parade has become more unequal. The small now, well, compared to when that was written, are even smaller, and the tall certainly are immeasurably taller than when that account was written. Now, I think that it's often seeing or hearing something like that, or becoming aware of the fact that you live in a society like that, that begins to make people uh, socialists, or perhaps experience in their own family. You know, my family, my, on my father's side, um, came from, uh, from South Wales. Um, and they were, uh, his father was a, uh, was a colliery sinker, somebody who dropped the, who dug the shafts in the mines. Now, he'd moved out of Wales and I wasn't brought up in Wales, but in my family, when we were growing up, no matter what anybody else said about Winston Churchill, Winston Churchill might be a war hero uh, for the vast majority of the population, but not in our house. In our house, he was the man who sent the troops to fire at striking miners in Tolopandi yeah. in South Wales, and he was a bastard, and that was the end of discussion. There was no further argument in my house about that, about that issue. And I think this is how many people become socialists. They read something which catches their imagination or makes them see the society in a different light, or something in their, their family history, or something in their individual experience begins to open up a, a different window on the way that the world works from how they're taught that it works, and the media, and the education system, and the church, and the government, and, the, and the, the politicians. And I think one of the things that I try to do with the, with the book is I think when people reach that point, they begin to see how the society is systematically linked together. The racism in the society isn't separate from the inequality in, in the society, that the questions of ownership aren't separate from the questions of life chances, that the way in which the police and the media react aren't accidental, or that the, you know, the Mark Duggan case that we heard about this morning isn't just one bad apple, that there's something systematically wrong with a society that works this way, and that the different elements that are wrong in the society are systematically linked in a particular, in a particular way. And I think that for me, certainly when I was, when I was growing up, I wish that at the point that I'd begun to think about the society uh, in that way. Somebody had given me a short and accessible book which kind of elaborated some of those arguments that, that made it clear why those things and how those things were connected. And that's something that I've, uh, I've tried to do, I've tried to do in, the, in the book. So one thing that I would say about it is really, um, if you're thinking about these things, if you're wondering why it is, that the discrimination against women and the discrimination against black people is linked to um, ownership in this society, of the faith that working people have and what can be done about it, about the very strategy that might be pursued to change the world, is a book written for you. 
but it's also a book written for another another purpose. It's not just a book, um, you know. I guess most people think about book, books, you know, like like all of us do when we're buying one. We think, am I interested in this? Um, am I going to get this out? Will I will I find this an easy book to read and so forth and so on? And and I hope that when I've read the book, you know, um, I'll know more and understand more than I did before I read it. I hope all that's true. But there's another thing about this book, really, which is it's not just a book to be read. This is a book um, to be sold by the people who've read it. Because one of the ways in which you can rebuild the strength of a socialist left, in which you can rebuild the trade unions, in which you can rebuild the resistance, is if the people at the core of the movement are sharing ideas and arguments which make them better able to organize, make them better able to defend the positions of the left, to defend anti-racist ideas, or to contest sexist ideas, or to defend trade unions, or to argue about why austerity is wrong or inequality is wrong. Everybody needs an argument to do that. Because the other side are generating arguments all the time. They have civil servants who are employed on a daily basis to come into work and write policy papers about why the cuts have got to take place. They have ranks of journalists who are paid to propagate exactly the opposite idea. They have institutions, um, which, you know, what, why is it, you might ask yourself in current circumstances, that Nigel Farage has been a guest on Question Time 25 times when the leader of the opposition has been a guest on Question Time five times. You might wonder why that is and what we can argue about it. And that's what this is for. It's about trying to knit together a collective movement and so I would like you to buy this book, but even more, I would like you to sell this book. I would like to be part of spreading ideas and organizing resistance to what's happening to us in the society, to do something about that huge parade, about the inequality, the gross inequality, the damaging of life chances, the constriction of, our, of another generation's uh, life chances, because our society is actually regressing. There are times when societies move forward and there are times when they regress and we are facing a moment of regression. You know, when I, uh, when, you know, when, when I was born, I think my mother and my father thought that we were the, the first lucky generation because I was the first person in my family ever born in an NHS hospital. I was the first person in my family ever to come home to a council house, to a publicly owned rather than privately rented house. I was the first person in my family who, when I was ill, I could be treated free at the point of need because of the existence of the NHS. I was the first person in my family to go to university at a time when not only fees but maintenance grants were paid by the state. Now these things are being taken away and they are being taken away very, very quickly. So quite contrary to what my parents thought, we weren't the first lucky generation. We are the only lucky generation. And the generations coming after us are fighting to hang on to things which our parents established and thought should be the right of every single working person in this country. And the task before us is not just to argue against it, but to organize against it. It won't change unless we force them to change. It won't change unless masses of working people did what they did in order to establish trade unions in the first place, to establish the right of women to vote in the first place, to establish the welfare state in the first place, and that is to contest, to struggle against, to bring down the giants in the system. The Lilliputians have to bind together to bring down the giants in that parade and to force them to grant us, at the very least, um, a fundamentally different life now and I believe if we do that, we will put on the agenda the fact that there sh should be and can be a fundamentally different society, one run by, controlled by the people who produce the wealth. And working people still have that power. You only have to think about it for a second. The minute working people decide to stop working, nothing moves. The shelves in the supermarket do not get filled. The power station turbine does not turn. The computer screen goes blank. The banking transaction does not happen. The buses and the tubes do not run, even in a city like this, a city of eight million people. And we need to rebuild a movement which can give working people the confidence to exercise that power in defense of what they've got and for the principle that things could be fundamentally different.
that the people who produce the wealth could own and control the wealth as well. And that, this book is dedicated to that proposition and to putting forward arguments which can defend that idea in public, in, in public uh, forums. So it's a, I hope it's a book that you'll read, but I hope even more that it's a book that you'll use with other people around you to knit together a stronger, better informed, better able to argue its corner movement than we have um, at, the, at the moment. Because organisation is really the only thing that, well, well two things. Working people, you know, they don't have power and money. They don't have access uh, to wealth. They don't have arms to enforce uh, their form, only occasions, to enforce their views. Their real strengths are only two. They are organisation and numbers. And even the numbers aren't any good without the organisation. The history of working class advance is the history of political organisation, of the charters, of the suffragettes, of the new unions, the building of the Labour Party, the building of political organisations. These are transformations in working people's ability to determine their own future and to shape the society around them. But nothing of those things, and nothing that we can do now, nothing that we did in the Stop the War Coalition, Nothing that we're doing now in the People's Assembly can be done without an organised core of socialists who have some historical reference points about what they're doing and why they're doing it, who've learned from the past what has worked and learned also what has failed and not to, re and not to repeat it. And that can only be transmitted through political organisation. You learn it through trade union organisation, through political organisation. In a way, um, a, a socialist, is a non-existent category. There is no such thing as an isolated socialist. It is, by definition, a collective enterprise. It's a collective idea and a collective enterprise. But that doesn't mean to say that the role of individuals within it is in any way diminished. You see, the uh, Italian uh, revolutionary Antonio Gramsci once said that there are no such thing, there is no such thing as a spontaneous revolt. There are only revolts where the marks of leadership have been erased by time. There is always somebody who begins the process of resistance. Always somebody who says, we should strike, or we should protest, or we should occupy Vodafone. There is always somebody who begins that process. And you know, it's the, it's the famous moment in the, in, the, in the Spartacus film, I mean, you've probably all seen it, where you know, they're trying to find, the Romans are trying to find the leader of the, of the Spartacus revolt and they come before the slaves, the crowd of slaves who are revolting, and they want, to, to, they want them to identify who is Spartacus. And uh, initially, Spartacus, because they're threatening the whole body of the slaves, stands up and says, I am Spartacus. And then another slave stands up and says, I am Spartacus. And another slave stands up and says, I am Spartacus, until they can't identify who Spartacus is. Now, that's the good version. There are alternative scenarios here. They could, the Romans could come along and say, who's Spartacus? And everybody says, is that fucker? That's Spartacus. And everything ends very, very badly with him being nailed to a cross. That can happen. Or the one guy who actually is Spartacus can just sit there looking at the floor and the Romans say, okay, back to slaving everybody. You know, nobody identifies. Or there can be the good solution. The solution actually exists in the film. An individual takes a stand and pulls people behind them. Isn't isolated, but organizes. And that doesn't just happen spontaneously, even though it does in that scene, well, actually, it's the, it's the culmination, even in the, in the film, of a whole slave revolt. But what it requires in modern terms is that people who got the idea in the first place begin to turn to the people next to them and say, we collectively should do something about this, that we collectively can work together to change this whether it's to stop the war, or to stop austerity, or to stop UKIP. It's a collective business. But the role of individuals within this is absolutely vitally important. Because there has to be somebody who turns to the people around them first and says, now is the moment that we can resist. And here's how we can resist. And here's how resistance has worked in the past. And this is what the society looks like. And this is where its weak points are. And this is what worked. And this is what didn't work in the past. The transmission of a tradition of resistance is what socialism is all about. So um, I guess really what I'd like to say now is um, if you aren't organized, 
you should be organized. No change can come without it. Nothing that working people have ever done has ever happened without, and specifically, without socialist organization. Because socialist organization is the collective Spartacus, is the people who started. You know, many of us who started to stop the war coalition, we were socialists, and we understood about imperialism and capitalism before we started. No, we didn't, couldn't, wouldn't want to do it on our own. We turned around to thousands of other people who possibly had never been politically active in their lives, and said, if we don't all do it together, we can't make a movement that could make a difference. Same with austerity. But that organizing core is the absolutely essential element of the continuity in resistance. that connects one form of resistance, one issue with another. So if you aren't yet organized, if you aren't yet part of that, this book is about trying to convince you and the people around you that you should be. absolutely brilliant and then um, a really excellent introduction not only what the book's about um, but really what I think a lot of people here at the festival uh, this weekend to discuss uh, those kind of ideas and yeah I remember when I was in school that's how I got into socialism was uh, by not being allowed to wear trousers as a girl at school and it's, it is often something as small as that and, and before you know it you've you've gone two or three steps along the line and realized that, that these things aren't isolated incidences um, and honestly, I wish someone had given me that book when I was about 15 because it would have saved me quite a lot of Googling. <laughs> so it is, it is definitely worth having a look at and, um, and buying. Um, and we've got quite a while for, um, for questions and contributions. I will ask people to keep it um, fairly short just to make sure that everyone who does want to speak uh, gets an opportunity to. Um, and you don't have to make a contribution if you just have a question that you want to ask. That's absolutely fine. Equally. John doesn't have to be the only person that answers questions. If you want to answer a question that somebody else has asked, uh, you're more than welcome to. Uh, so I'm going to see a show of hands if anyone would like to uh, begin. Yeah, I and mean, the first thing I want to just say is, is a little bit about um, the discussion that we're having. Because you see, in many ways, uh, I mean, I think it's a very good discussion. There are very important points that are being, be, being raised. Nobody could say that the discussion that we're having here isn't an informed, intelligent discussion that you can't get in the vast majority of the media. And that's what happens when you get groups of people, you know, ordinary working people and socialists and trade unions together. That's exactly what happens. But, but think about that. That doesn't happen spontaneously. It takes somebody to organize an event like this or to have a website like Canterbury. To, to organize that discussion is in itself a proof of the argument that I've been putting. So even if you don't agree with some, or if you don't agree with any of the points that I'm going to make in, re in reply to some of the questions, the point is still made that without this form of organization, we wouldn't even be able to have that discussion. Indeed, we wouldn't even be able to share the information. Because I think many, many people are in exactly the position that, that you're in. They react, they don't like the system. They react against it. They have conversations with the people in their pubs. But hey, you know, if you aren't in, a left-wing organisation, how the hell are you going to know that I mean, Manchester had 150 people in the streets only two nights ago. On the same night, I was speaking to 40 people at the People's Assembly meeting in, in, in Middlesbrough. We've got a meeting coming up in Liverpool where they booked the biggest hall in Liverpool, um, which will have 600 people at it against austerity. We don't even know what we are doing unless we organise the mechanisms that, that can transmit that information. So we are always on the defensive and on the prep uh, uh, and pray to the picture that the media or the press or the press gives us so that's the, f the first thing the second thing is I, I, there are times when you are very on the de uh, on the defensive when generally sort of socialist or left-wing ideas are a minority idea and there are some issues well that's always true it is true on the question of, of immigration still but on you look at the government's own survey of public, it's the, it's the most authoritative survey of public opinion that there is. It's called the, the British Social Attitude Survey. It's a book like this. The government does the, uh, does the, the work, um, the opinion poll work. It's the most authoritative picture that you get every, I think it's every two years it's published. And what it shows you is this, that although the entire political elite have moved towards neoliberal economics and attacks on the welfare state, and increasing inequality and attacks on trade unions, actually, the vast majority of working people don't believe it. If you ask, uh, the question is asked, 
Um, should there be any further privatisation? 84% of people say no, there shouldn't. Should the rail network be brought back into nationalisation? 77% of people think it should. We know that the opinion polls against the wars have run consistently against the government for 13 years since we started uh, the anti-war the anti movement in this country. Do you think that the NHS should be free at the point of, uh, of need and not subject to privatisation? Massive majorities think that this is the case. The problem is not that there isn't an opening, at least an opening, if not a great deal of agreement with what the left says on some absolutely key issues. The weakness is organisation. The weakness is the ability to translate those views into effective political opposition. That's what's missing at every level. In rebuilding the trade unions, are they weaker? Do they need to rebuild? Of course they do. Do we need more strike action, not less? Yes, of course we do. Do we need more demonstrations and protests and direct action? Of course we do. But all this requires political organisation. And in particular, at the heart of it, it requires the people who are going to start that debate, who are saying, yes, this is the political landscape that we're in. This is what we can do. This is the next project that we should be engaged on. And that, that particular form of organisation is socialist organisation. It always has been in the, in the movement. So I agree, you know, when Seamus raises the question of a left-wing populism, yeah, I think that, you know, a lot of the left in this country think that the rock working class are more right-wing than they actually are, and they think that the main thing for them to do is to differentiate themselves from what ordinary working people are thinking. I think the problem is exactly the opposite. I think the left is too distant from where working class people are. It doesn't engage with them enough. It doesn't organize alongside them. It thinks of a thousand reasons why we can't be like them or can't be like anybody else. And I think it's a, it's a kind of serial madness on sections of the left that when you've got a bunch of people, the number of millions in this country, who want left-wing ideas not to work alongside them and create the kind of institutions where you're struggling alongside them is an idiocy which is going to lead to the destruction of the left. So that's the project, as far as I'm, as far as I'm concerned. But, and this is the caveat, right-wing populism is always easier to achieve than left-wing populism. Why? Because you feed off existing prejudices. Nigel Farage isn't popular because of what Nigel Farage or the bunch of I, my one moment of agreement with, with David Cameron, the uh, nut jobs and fruitcakes in <laughs> UKIP do, he's popular because every single day the Daily Mail and the Daily Express and the BBC promote the same thing. And the political elite cave into him. I mean, what was Nick Clegg doing? I mean, talk about dumb and dumber. Dumb to give him the platform of two national TV debates, even dumber to lose the debate to him. That's really, that gave him a massive leg up weeks before the election. So left-wing populism requires more organisation, more thought and more argument to achieve than right-wing populism because it's feeding off, spinning off what already exists in the hierarchy of the society and brings you back to the same thing. It requires this kind of organisation and this kind of argument. And on the question of, um, and, and you know, you give a serious threat, but, but let's just stand back. These are going to be the best set of elections for UKIP. The general election will be harder. The turnout in this set of elections was 35%. UKIP got 35% of that, that means UKIP got 9% of the electorate. Now that's a serious threat, but it's not 1933 in Germany, you know, the stormtroopers aren't coming down Whitehall just yet. It will become worse if we don't confront it, and it will become worse if we think we can only confront it, and we should confront it directly by challenging the racists, by naming them as racists, but the other thing we have to understand is these people are feeding off demoralization and the effects of austerity among working people and our job is to give them a better and progressive way of fighting back and that's what the People's Assembly is all about. We've got this huge demonstration on the 21st of June, there's going to be a TUC demonstration in the autumn, there's going to be a, a hopefully a co combined strike action by some of the biggest unions in the country on the 10th of July. We want to get out of the electoral field which is always the most uh, favorable territory for the right wing and onto the streets where trade unions and mass organisations are most effective. Now that's not to say, Comrade raised the question of an electoral challenge. I'm for an electoral challenge. You know, I, you know, I, I, I long, long, I never and uh, believe that Labour could transform society. I actually believe what R. H. Tawney, the old uh, Christian socialist historian, said uh, about trying to reform the system. He said, "You can skin an onion, skin by skin." but you can't skin a tiger claw by claw. 
and that's what this system is like. It will have to be confronted and broken. It can't be reformed from 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 within. Even though I'll you know I'll, I'll vote Labour at the next election if that's the only choice on the ballot paper, because I can see the difference between a party composed of working people and still backed by the trade unions and the open representatives of the giants in that parade. I know the difference between those two things, even if I don't think Labour are going to change anything. I'm for a left party <coughs> being built, but it's a hard gig, and it's a hard gig for this reason. Everything else that the left does, if you're in a trade union, you combine with people who perhaps don't vote, who vote Green, who vote Labour, you combine in a union organisation to strike and defend uh, conditions of wages and so forth. If you're in a mass movement, like the anti-war movement, we've got, of course, we have green voters, green MEPs, labor people, people in left unity, all of them in the same organization. But when it comes to an election, it's more divisive. It's the most divisive thing you do, because you run on your total program, and everybody else runs on their total program. So it's a more divisive thing for the left. So I'm for it, but it's hard to do, and it's hard to do unless you're coming off the back of a huge mass movement which creates a radical wave. So I don't think my, I, I, you know, I'm very sympathetic to the Comrades and Left Unity, you know, some of the people we work closest with in the, in the Stop the War Coalition are involved in it. I don't think the timing is right. Um, but I wish it well, and I hope that the time does become right, but in the meantime, we need to create the resistance now. What they're doing to us won't wait. It's happening today and next week, and it'll be happening the day after the next general election as well. So the mass movement is not the least possibility of change. It's the greatest possibility of change. Thank you, John. I, I can see a couple of people have their hands up. I know there was somebody who had their hand up before John spoke. As I said before, from all political parties, Labour Party supporters, like Owen Jones and you know and indeed Tony Benn was his president before uh, we lost him this uh, this year. People from the from the Green Party, uh, people from Cantafire and revolutionary organisations. So uh, and that's how it has to be really. Um, now my hope is that we will change the political landscape um, so that anybody who is in the next government will find it impossible to carry through austerity programs. If it's a Tory government, they'll find it impossible. If it's a Labour government, they'll find it impossible because there is a mass movement, which includes many of their own members, who are saying to them, no, this is un unacceptable. You know, Unite the Union, which is you know, a huge donator to the, to, the, to the Labour Party, the biggest union in the country, is supporting the People's Assembly, and I regard that as a crack in the ability of Labour to impose austerity after the next uh, after the next election, and the more of that, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Because my interest is in shifting the balance of the argument and the balance of power from the uh, negotiating rooms of Whitehall to the streets uh, of London to say this is where it's being decided, and you've got to take notice of it, whoever you are. And that's really where I see that's what I see the people simply doing. And I think if it's successful in doing that, it will be a rising tide which lifts all ships. I think if we do that, I think the left of the Labour Party will be more powerful uh, than it is now. I think the left outside the Labour Party, including Left Unity, including Counterpart, will be better able to put their arguments if we're successful in doing that. So everybody who's on the left, no matter what their party affiliation is, has got an interest in shifting that balance of power and creating that kind, that kind of movement. Now, uh, you know, uh, I've been asked about the effectiveness of these movements. Um, I think you have, to, and this is one of the advantages of thinking historically of being in a movement which can, can train you to think uh, about previous events and, and the part activists played in them. You see, I, I never thought, by the way, um, that we would necessarily break the government, even with the biggest demonstration in British political history against the Iraq war. I understand why many people acted for the first time coming onto that demonstration, so big, so huge, how can they not take notice of us, how can they not um, do it. Now, I always thought we would probably need something else. I mean, we did call for strike action, there was a limited amount of strike action, that might have broken the government there and then. But that wasn't quite enough. But, therefore, you have to learn to think about the effects of what you do on a different kind of time scale. So, okay, it didn't work pantomime style. It wasn't that we rushed onto one side of the stage with our, you know, no to war in Iraq placards and all the bad people rushed off the other side of the stage in defeat. It didn't work like that. But it did work, because relentlessly, over more than a decade, we established, and this was, and this, we should never forget how big a thing this is, majority public opinion for a hard left position, 
an anti-war position established and sustained for over a decade. The number of times that that's happened is as rare as hen's teeth. And at the end of that time, a British Prime Minister went to the House of Commons and for the first time since 1782 asked for a vote for war over Syria and didn't get it. And that was the cumulative effect of not just one demonstration, but of repeated campaign demonstrations. Now, if we hadn't have done that, they would have got that vote and the missiles from Western ships from UK submarines would still be falling on Damascus and Aleppo. Now, however tragic the blood count and the death count is in Syria now, it would be worse if we'd been engaged in that, uh, in that war. Similarly with the student thing. I'll tell you what the victory of the student demonstrations was. The eradication of the Liberal Democrats at the last, uh, at the last election. That the effect. So you have to think of it on, in not just in one register or one time scale about what you're about what you're you're, you're, you're doing. Final couple of points on brainwashing. You see, the thing is, things are very rarely a monolith. It's very rarely all this or all that. Things usually exist with a kind of polarised contradiction. The people think, oh yeah, maybe there is too much immigration, but I want to get rid of this government and this austerity is rubbish. You know, people hold two different ideas in, in, in their mind. You know, I was talking about my father and his attitude to, you know, he came from a South Wales mining family. He was a trade unionist all his life. He was standing absolutely hopelessly uh, for the Labour Party in, in, in the war he could never win uh, for the Labour Party in the, in the West Country all his life. Uh, and uh, he used to sit down every Christmas and watch the Queen's broadcast. And I just couldn't get it. I can't get it to this day. <laughs> what the hell? You know, what's going on there? And people's ideas always exist like this. You know, Gramsci, who I quoted before, said, there's a competition in people's minds between what he's called common sense. And he said, common sense is the day-to-day -day ideology of the bourgeoisie. The thing that you receive from the press from an accepted opinion. The poor are always with us. There'll always be the, poor, uh, the rich man in his castle and the poor man at his gate. There will always be ambitious people get to the top. That stuff. And then they're experienced, thinking, I'm just not going to take this shit anymore. I just can't. And they start to do something about it. And that's the point where it breaks down. When the deeds begin. You know, in the beginning was the deed. When people begin to act and begin to organise, then the ideas begin to shift their balance from common sense to good sense the good sense that we working people have from their families, from their trade union membership, from their political history, from their own experience. But the action is the key. Action clarifies thinking. You know, people, there's a, there's a prejudice in the society um, to, to kind of praise people who are thinkers and intellectuals and artists and whatnot. But the real heroes are the people who do things, who change things, who act to change the world around them. Because everything that we do, at all the mass movements, all the trade unionism, it's a mosaic of individual acts. Unless people become organised, unless people decide to do it themselves and to combine with others, we can't change the world. If we do decide to act and do combine with others, then anything is possible. But it begins with the process of action, and action means organisation. For us, action means organisation. So the real heroes, for me, are the people who are organised and active and changing the world around them, and I invite you to join them. about London, there is actually a session called London versus the rest, regions in equality and resistance uh, in venue one, which you might be interested to go to if, uh, if